may be as confrontational as, as some Christians sometimes make it, okay? If, you, if someone's kind of on the edge and you want to expose them to some of the spiritual realm and God and Jesus, this is a perfect opportunity because it's fun, there's lights, it's, it's not as intimidating as some other environment. So um, depends who they are. But grab some of these pamphlets and then hand them out, okay? Before we get Pastor Mike Mass up here, I want to do something special this morning. I think they like you. How many of you noticed when you walked in the foyers and the IB this morning that it looked a little different? Yeah. It looks nice, doesn't it? This is home. I don't know about you, but I see this as my home. That's why when I come into the IB, I don't put my gum on my chair or I don't sp uh, stick it on the wall. I don't come in with food and drink. It's not allowed. I obey the rules because I want to see people after me enjoy this facility too. One minute. Come on up here quickly. All those of you who helped us paint from Thursday, Friday, Saturday, come on up here. I want everyone to see who you are. There's student council, RAs. These guys, come on up. Come join me. Come up here. Thank you, India. Everyone else, come on up. Come up. You guys are so humble. Come on up. <laughs> okay, now we started this project. Hang on a second. We started spread out nice and wide so we can see your faces. We started this project Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We covered all the hallways. Look at these doors. They're darker. You can see all the doors, all the hallways, the foyer, handrails. Everything and anything from Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we calculated about 800 man hours spent to renovate this project. Painting is fun only for the first 30 minutes and then it gets, becomes work, okay? And so they stick with us Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Some of them only went home midnight on Friday and Saturday. They didn't expect any money. How many of you know that's the kind of stuff Jesus would have done? He wasn't always just at the altar worshiping, even though he did that, but his fruit show. And so I want to thank all of you students on behalf of the leadership, the Lindsay's Doc Holler, for all your work and your investment. Thank you. Give it up for them as they make their way back to their seats. Thank you. You all ready to hear from Pastor Mike Massa? Hey, give a warm CFNI welcome to Mike Massa this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Let, let me... Uh, I need you to acknowledge my wife, Nancy Nancy. Will you stand, please? Stand up. You are free to ask her any question except the one I told you not to ask about. Second Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I've got to say the reference one more time for the holler's sake. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. Verse 7. But if the ministry of death written and engraved in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great openness of speech. Unlike Moses, say those two words, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil 
is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory into glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Father, thank you for the way you do things. Thank you for your signature on our hearts, on our lives. May it become more and more obvious that you are the one at the front of the line. May it be more conspicuous that you are leading the way for us, for this place, for our future, and for your honor. This is your time, sir, and may your spirit have every liberty to reveal who you are to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to give an answer to that question with two facets to it. I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to answer the question with two facets. Then I'm going to give you a spiritual and practical exercise to implement the answer to the question. Then we're going to make some applications about making decisions, prayer, worship, and fulfilling your destiny. So the question, an answer with two parts, an exercise to implement that answer, and then apply that answer in making decisions, prayer places, worship places, and fulfilling our destiny. Several weeks ago, my oldest son, Aaron, asked the question. And it was a striking one because as a teacher, I had more than one answer. And he said, Dad, what's one thing, if somebody did that one thing, would most dramatically impact their life? If a person were to do one thing, what is the one thing that if they did that, it would most transform, revolutionize their life? And I knew that he didn't want me to use, he's not against the Bible, but he didn't want me to use a a spiritual answer because he was asking it for somebody who didn't know Jesus as well as for a believer. What is the one thing that if you do that one thing, it will most dramatically change your life for the better? So I considered it for several minutes, and then here was the answer. To courageously face who you are. To courageously face who you are. If you and I can courageously do that, and I'm going to talk about how to do that in a moment. If we can courageously face who we are, it will most powerfully impact and transform us. I'm convinced of it. Now let me tell you a few people who did not courageously face who they were. In the Garden of Eden, Adam did not courageously face who he was. When he found out about his disobedience, he hid, covered it up with the fig leaves, and he and Eve hid because they didn't courageously face the fact that they were disobedient. They didn't face the fact that they were still, by the will of God, they were still the managers over the earth, but they didn't courageously face that either. And they were not willing to face their failure, their disobedience, their their wrong. The rich young ruler came to Jesus in Matthew 19 and asked a really good question. What can I do? What, what can I do? What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? That's a good question. And Jesus answered it. Sell everything you've got, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And the rich young ruler went away sorrowful. And it's interesting because the Bible says that Jesus loved the guy. But he would not courageously face who he was. And he was a greedy man who was worshiping his money more than he wanted eternal life. 
And he wouldn't courageously face that reality. Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. The Spirit of God is moving all through the church in Jerusalem. There is underway. And people like Barnabas are selling all their property and giving the money from the sale to the church, giving it to the Lord. And Ananias and Sapphira like the PR that they're getting. So they agree together to sell their house. And the money, the numbers aren't given, but let's say they sell it for 100000 and then they keep 50 of it. And then they walk up, Ananias walks up to Peter and says, we sold our house for 50000 bucks. Here it is. Here's the money. Now, the Spirit of God rises in Peter and says, the man's lying. And Peter says, Ananias, you were under no obligation to sell your home. And when you sold it, you had the right to do with the money what you wanted. But to give the impression that you're giving everything when you're only giving part. See ya. Boom. He's slain in the spirit. Gone. Slain in the spirit. That was a joke. He missed it. But he, he, <laughs> he, he died. And you know who carried his corpse out? The youth, young people. How like that for youth ministry? <laughs> That'd be serious youth followers of Jesus. Well... Sapphira comes in three hours later, and she doesn't know what happened in the night. And Peter doesn't know if, she, if she's collaborated or not with Ananias. So Peter does know this. He does know that if she lies, she's dying. How do you like that for a pastoral position? If Sapphira lies, she's, she's going to be dead. And so I'm, I'm thinking if I'm an usher in church that day, when Sapphira walks in, I'm thinking, psst, Safi. <laughs> it's been kind of serious in church today. <laughs> you might want to courageously face who you are. But nobody warns her. And Peter asked her, he said, did you? Sell it for 50,000 bucks. And she goes, yep. He goes, bye. Boom. And the same young people carried her out. What's the youth ministry? What would you do today? Oh, we carried out the people God killed in church. That's what we did. <laughs> but Ananias and Sapphira would not courageously face who they were. The truth is they had a greed problem. And they were trying to make an impression to people. They really didn't want to love the Lord fully. But if they courageously faced who they were, they could have been changed. But see, I cannot face who I am. I cannot courageously face who I am apart from the Lord himself. I can't do that. I can't accurately and courageously face me and discover me without him. Jeremiah 17 says, my heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Who can know what's really going on in me except that the Lord shows me who I am? In John 6, 46, I mean Luke 6, 46, excuse me. Luke 6, 46, Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? Now, do you see the discrepancy there? When if I say Lord, Lord, but don't do what he says, there's some sort of disconnect with me that I'm not courageously facing. I call him Lord, but I don't do what he says. That doesn't match. There's, there's a discrepancy. There's, a, there's a, a disconnection between what I'm saying and who I really am. I'm telling, I'm telling, I'm saying you're Lord, but I'm not doing what he's saying. The next verse, verse 47 says, Jesus said, whoever comes to me, whoever comes to me, hears my words and does them, I will show you what that man is like. See, if you want to find out who you really are, you've got to courageously face who you are. Here's the two sides of the answer. I've got to courageously face who I am without Jesus, and I've got to courageously face who I am in Jesus. And both of those things are scary. Both of those things are scary. 
I've got to courageously face who I am without Jesus and courageously face who I am in him. Because when you and I find out what he really wants to do in us, in him, that's scary. And it ought to be impossible for you and me to do it on our own. It's really scary when you begin to realize what God wants to do in and through us, in his son. It takes courage to face who I am without him. It takes courage to face who you and I are in him. The first kind of thing is I've got to see who I am without him. To see the selfishness, the, the meanness, the anger, the pride, the arrogance, the unclean, the violence, the sin that so easily I do, the lust, the greed, the vindictiveness, all kinds of things, the desire to retaliate. January the 2nd, 2015, in ICU with the lymphoma in my body, about that big right there, I was, I was two days away from dying, and I, I, I fell in ICU. ICU nurses don't like it when their patients fall. They don't like that at all. So I woke up January the 3rd, and that whiteboard in front of me that said fall risk and severe was checked. And there was a little band on my right wrist that said fall risk, and I got offended. <laughs> I'm not going to fall. And the Lord said, can I talk to you? I said, yes, sir. You don't think you're going to fall? No, sir. Him who thinks he stands, take heed, lest he fall. I went, oh. And then he said, can I tell you something else? I said, sure. <laughs> he said, you've been arrogant. Up to that moment, I didn't, I didn't know that. I was blind as a bat. But as soon as he said it, five things lined up in here. And I went, oh. And I mean bad. I don't mean a little bit of pride. I mean bad, bad. And he says to me, Mike, it's difficult for me to give grace to prideful people. He gives grace to the humble. He resists the prideful. He wasn't mad at me. He wasn't angry with me. He was simply informing me of my status. And I had to courageously face, at that moment, I'm an arrogant man. Now, God didn't give me the cancer. That was a devilish attack. But I was apparently in a better position for him to talk to me at that point. Can you and I courageously face who we are? And I don't know who I am apart from being in front of him. In Psalms, it says, in his light, we see light. I don't know clearly until I'm in front of him who I am. I heard about a lady. She wasn't here. I heard about a lady who was wanting to be a missionary, and, and she was in her mid-40s, late 40s, not married, and she was ready to go to the mission field and made preparations and was looking forward to it and all that kind of thing. And one day, the Lord said, can I talk to you? And she said, sure. I need to tell you who you are. The truth is, you hate men. You have lesbian tendencies, and you want to hide all that by going to the mission field. Now, can you courageously face the revelation of who you are without Jesus? Because I'm not really going to be transformed until I can see both who I am without him and who I am in him. Both are scary. Both are difficult to see and to witness, and it takes courage to face them. The Lord told Peter, you are going to deny me three times before the rooster crows twice. Peter said, no, I won't. <laughs> Let's make it four. How about that? Let's make it four. <laughs> it's crazy. Jesus is right. Whatever he says, he's right. 
Peter should have said, of course, Lord, forgive me in advance for the three times I'm going to deny you before the night's over. He was not courageously facing who he Jesus said, you are a three-time denier, boy. And Peter said, no, I'm not. Uh-huh. What Jesus says is right. Amen. Amen. I like it. Listen, if God tells you you're a jerk, you are blessed. <laughs> because now you're no longer a deceived jerk. All of us have known for quite a while that was your state. We were waiting for you to find out. <laughs> he didn't face who he was. To courageously face who we are is not about looking in the mirror. This is not about self-examination. It's not about you taking your eyes and looking at yourself. My heart is deceitfully wicked, and I can't know what's in me. It's in his light I see light. I've got to courageously face the one who loves me the most and who knows me best of all, and let him tell me, who do you say that I am? And if you make your goal, this is the tricky part, if you make your goal, I want to find out who I am, if you make that the goal, you're going to miss the point because you're going to find out who you are by making him the point, not yourself. If you make your identity your goal, you're going to be worshiping yourself and not him. You want to find out who he is. Peter got it right one time when he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he made his point of emphasis the Lord himself. And then the, Jesus said, and you are Peter. Then he told him who he was after he submitted the revelation about who Jesus is. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. He saw who he was in the Lord's presence. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah courageously faced who he was. In God's presence, he sees God, and Isaiah's conclusion is, I'm a man of unclean lips. He sees who he is in front of the Lord. Now, just a few verses later, God says, Who am I, who's going to go for us? Whom shall I send? And Isaiah sees himself now in God. Here am I. Send me. You've got to courageously face both. Who am I without him? And who are you and I in him? It's scary. Saul of Tarsus is on the road to Damascus. Saul, Saul, Jesus shows up. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you? I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And he told him, see, Saul is thinking, I am doing the will of God. Saul's whole point is he believes he's doing God's will. The truth is he's fighting the very thing that God is doing on the planet. He's opposing it, but he's got to courageously face what's going on. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. What a revelation, huh? To be thinking that the whole time you're doing the will of God and find out you are resisting the very thing he's doing, opposing it. And then God tells Ananias, different Ananias, he says, he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentile nations, before kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. See, he faced who he was without the Lord. You are persecuting Jesus. Then he had to face, courageously face, whom God was going to make him. And I must show you how much you must suffer for my name's sake. Got to see both. Got to see both. 
Mary, all by herself. Teenage girl, probably. Gabriel shows up. Gabriel says, the Spirit of God's going to come on you. The power of the highest is going to overshadow you. And that which will be born in you will be called the Son of God. And Mary said, I'll take it. Be it unto me according to your word. She courageously faced who she was. Did she understand with her head? Of course not. But she courageously faced what God was saying was her place. You want to get in front of the Lord. And here's the exercise I want to share with you. You want to get in front of the Lord. Get in front of him. Take your Bible, pen and paper. Don't take music with you this time. Just you and him. Don't take music. Get by yourself. Get place where you can be still and be quiet. And read the Bible out loud. When you read the Bible, what do you do? Read it out loud and slow down. Slow way down. Read the Bible out loud and slow down. And read the Bible to yourself. Read it to yourself. Read it to yourself. And look at me, please. Pay attention to your spirit while you're reading. If you're going to courageously face who you are without him and courageously face who you are in him, you're going to have to find out how he talks to you. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God is not brain. God is spirit. Jesus said, John 6, 63, my words are spirit and they are life. They are spirit and they are life. I was talking to a guy here a couple of years ago. We're talking and he said, he said, I knew it was God talking to me because I had the goosebumps go down my spine. And I, 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 inside I went, what? That's how you know it's God? What verse in Exodus are you claiming for that? I mean, that's what he said. He said it confidently. I knew it was God because I had the goosebumps go down my spine. And I went, man, you're in trouble. Because I can, I can give you goosebumps down your spine with an air conditioning vent. Really? You're going to make a decision based on goosebumps down your spine? Well, I only had 214, so it's maybe not all the way God, you know. It, it, it's just crazy to me. It's crazy. How do you know God's talking to you? Is it because you feel something? Let me tell you something, James. Let me tell you what, what blessing God gave me big time. Big, big time. December. 28, 1973, First Baptist Church, Christmas break. I'm painting the church building with three other guys. And a guy from CFNI is there. Steve Pippen came in 1973 before all y'all were born. And he was praying for my brother up in the primary two department, Sunday school department, right above me. Doug Bates next to me says hallelujah, throws his paintbrush in the air and runs upstairs because he already speaks in tongues. I don't. And I've been seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit for over a year and a half. And I read everything from Bob Buse who said if you don't speak in tongues, you are from the, you, you, you're not saved to M.R. DeHaan who said if you do speak in tongues, you are of the devil. I read everybody from soup to nuts. I read them all. I, I knelt down at one place. I, I worked as a youth pastor one, one summer. God bless those young people. And I, I got down and I went like this. <laughs> waiting for some lightning bolt to make me, you know, grab hold of me and shake me and make me speak in tongues. You know, whatever, do that. <laughs> and I went up there and, and Steve was already praying for my brother. And I knelt down by the door of the primary two Sunday school department, 
And my very first word was zongta. I have no idea what it means, hallelujah. <laughs> but I, I'm so glad I didn't feel a thing. Hallelujah. Because I don't need to feel something in my body to determine if God's present or not. Now, I am not bothered if you feel God. There are moments when I have, but I don't care if I do or don't. It doesn't matter. And it's certainly not goosebumps down my spine. That's God. Woo! Because <laughs> if you make decisions based on how your body feels, the devil's got you the rest of your life. you got to courageously face who you are and learn how to hear him in your spirit. You need to hear him here. People do this. Look at me. Look, at look, look, look. They go, God, talk to me. No, 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 no. He talks to you down here, not up here. He talks here. Out of your belly flow rivers of living water, talking about the spirit. So read your Bible, because those words are spirit and their life. Read your Bible out loud slowly and pay attention to your spirit for about 45 minutes or an hour. Yes, I mean 45 minutes or an hour. Yes, actually 45 minutes or an hour, not 10. You'll read 10 minutes. Man, I must have been going 45 minutes easy, and you'll only be going eight minutes. Just read it. Take your, take your time. Slow down. And read it for 45 minutes to an hour and pay attention here. Not what you're feeling. Not what you're, what, ooh, Jesus, ooh, what Jesus. I think Jesus got, an angel must come in room. Whatever. <laughs> What's he saying down here? Now, the first time you do that, you won't hear anything. Good. Do it again the next day. 45 minutes to an hour. Get someplace quiet. Get by yourself and read the Bible out loud. Slow down and listen. And you won't hear anything the second day. So what are you going to do now? Do it again. Third day, do it again. About two weeks in, there will be an occasion where you won't feel anything, but you'll have this awareness. Hmm. Now, when that, when that awareness comes, don't tell anybody about that. Don't do that. Don't talk to people. Don't, don't tell the secret things God's telling you. Don't, don't. Whenever you can see the roots of a tree, it's not good. Okay? So people walk up and say, Mike, let me tell you what God told me. They pull their roots out. Like, don't do that. Keep it in the ground, man. Keep it there. And you, you weigh that. Now then, the next morning in chapel, or Dr. Holler's class, or whomever, they say what you heard the day before. And you go, hop, hey, don't raise your hand. Don't, don't shout, hey, man, I heard that yesterday. Don't do that. <coughs> Just Jesus. You, you were talking to me. And you heard him. One of the first times that Nancy blessed me so deeply, we were having a very intimate heart-to-heart -heart conversation. This was early on. And our faces were just right next to each other. And she said, I said to her, I love you. And she went, I know. <laughs> she didn't say, I love you too, back. She didn't feel the need to do something to equal it up. She just received it. She just took it. I know. Have you ever tried to work with somebody on something and they're just not hearing you? And you're going, man, I'm trying to make this simple, but they aren't getting it at all. And then one day, 
I mean, you're working, you love them, you care about them, and you want to get it through, but they're not getting it. They're not hearing you. And then one day, they go, oh, 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 you mean, yeah, they say, ah, way to go. And then you relax because they've heard you. If you'll spend some time in the Word, read the Bible out loud, slow down, be there consistently, Pay attention here, and you'll begin to recognize how God talks to you. And then you'll have all this anxiety, all this groping and this desperate, I got it, I got it, I got it. And one day when you know that he heard you, The anxiety goes away. It just, you don't work at it. You don't get rid of it. It just goes away because you know he heard you. And he's going to say to you, I love you. And you're going to say, I know. The desperate desire to, I gotta, I gotta find God, I gotta find God. What, what, ah! And you're desperate to find Him. Just get quiet. Don't play music. Just speak the word. Pay attention to your spirit. Stay there day after day. And one of those days, I promise you. If you will courageously face who you are in front of him in his word, one of those days you will hear him talk to you and you will know it's God. You will know. No question. You won't think it. You won't feel it. You won't have a mood. There won't be an atmosphere. You'll just know. You'll know. And guess what? <laughs> now you're living. We live by the words that come out of his mouth. I'm not alive, nor are you, until I've heard what he said. And I'm doing, he said, if you will come to me, hear my words, and do what I say. I will show you what that man is like. Now you'll begin to see him. If I'll courageously face who I am without him, courageously face who I am in him, now I'm living. When his spirit begins to talk to you, now you're living. Now you're actually living. And guess what? You're not intimidated anymore. October, November, 2014, when the pain was in my gut between two and four hours every night, and I'm too stubborn to tell Nancy what I'm going through, and I'm in agony. I mean, it's like a knife. It's like a knife for two to four hours every night. Start about 8 o'clock, go to almost midnight, just, just, just digging in my gut. I'm crying, and I'm under the covers in the bed, crying, trying to courageously face who I am. I'm a sick man, and I'm calling on him, I'm crying out to him in my tears and in my agony, and I'm saying, Lord, there is not one story in the Scriptures, not one story of anybody that came to you who was in trouble that you turned them away. And I don't think you're going to turn away from me. And that went on for several weeks. And one night, I don't know the date, I can't tell you, one night he met me under the covers. <laughs> and he told me, he told me, I've heard you. I've heard you. And I knew I was in trouble. I knew my physical situation was bad. And by that time, I knew there was likely a cancer in my body, but I was not intimidated. Because I knew the one who loves me the most 
had heard me. And I was at ease. Now physically it got more severe after that. And I got much closer to death than life after that. But I knew he had heard me. And I never prayed to be healed again. I simply thanked him for hearing me. Because I knew he'd heard me. When you pray in the Spirit, do the same thing. Get by yourself and pray in tongues. You know how for how long? You know how for how, for how long? 45 minutes to an hour, do that. <laughs> pray in tongues. You can do that fast or slow, I don't really care. <laughs> pray in tongues and pay attention to your spirit. Don't, don't try to feel something. Don't try to create a mood. Just pray in the spirit and pay attention to your spirit. And awarenesses will begin to rise. Now, read the Bible, pray in tongues, listen. Read the Bible, pray in tongues, listen. That's quite a combo. And just be there and let him train your spirit and you begin to recognize what he sounds like to you. My mother's 91 years old. She quit mowing the grass about three years ago. Now, if she were to call you up, most of you wouldn't recognize her at all. And I would know her immediately. Hi, Mom. You got you to be loud because she can't hear well. Sharp as a tack, but, man, you got to scream in the phone. It's crazy. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> but if I gave you a high-quality recording of my mother speaking over the phone, about 25 minutes worth of her talking over the phone, and you played that recording every day, and then she called you a couple of months from now. And you'd say, well, hello, Betty. Good to hear from you. Because you'd recognize her voice. This is a very high-quality recording of how God talks. And if you'll read that, with any kind of confidence that the words are spirit and life, pay attention to your spirit. You'll start recognizing his voice, and it won't be based on a feeling or goosebumps or, you know, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> and I'm not against any of that. I'm just saying if, if, it, if you're going to make decisions based on how it feels, it's going to be easy for the enemy to fool you. All right? Who's going to play the piano? Where'd he go? Faith, you going to do it? Okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. She's just going to play the piano. She's not going to dance a jig. She's just going to play the piano. See, too often, you all, too often, listen to me carefully. We are into events, and God's into process. God's not against events, but events become fake and, and, and flawed when they don't correspond to how you've been living before the event happened. People want to, I got to get to church on Sunday because my life's miserable. Well, why don't you love Jesus Monday through Saturday, and then you, when, the, when you meet at church on Sunday, you won't be a hypocrite. Man, we had church today. Well, are you, are you the church Monday through Saturday? Or do you got to have some cheerleader pick me up because you're living off emotions and not out of your spirit? Let me just be real open. Huh. Moses did not courageously face who he was. Moses comes down from the mountain the last time with that second set of tablets that God had written on. And his face is shining. And he puts a veil over it. But you know what happened? That glory began to go away. 
And Moses kept on wearing the veil, giving the impression that his face was still shining. You know anybody like that? Who talks about the glory five, 10, 15 years ago, and they act like their life is still shining, but it's not? We are not like Moses, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face. We all with unveiled faces. Not hiding who I am apart from him and courageously facing who I am in him. Transformed, glory to glory. Get in front of him, take the veil off. Get in front of him, take the veil off. Face, courageously face who you are without him. I'm an angry, mean-spirited, arrogant, lust-filled man. Hallelujah. You're facing who you are because he's shown you who you are. Now, have you got the courage to say, who have you made me in your son? And though Paul was a blasphemer, no longer was he that. Huh. Can you courageously let go of the junk because he's shown you who you are in him? And the, the history keeps condemning. The history keeps defiling. The history keeps saying, you messed up, you messed up, you messed up. I know I did, hot shot. But the Lord had something else to tell me. He didn't just show me who I was without him. He showed me who I am in him. And I've seen both. And I'm willing to trust that he is able to do in me what he said he would do. Amen. If you are here and you have not yet spoken in tongues and you would like to, would you come forward, please? If you are here and you have not yet spoken in tongues and you would like to, I want you to come forward, please. Courageously face. Courageously face. Guys and gals, courageously face who you are. Come in here in front of me, please. Just walk and face me this way. Anybody else? You have not yet spoken in tongues, but you would like to. You've received Jesus as the Lord of your life. You have? When you pray in the Spirit, your brain is not fruitful, the Bible says. Your brain doesn't understand. The Spirit lives here, and when He begins to express Himself, He bypasses your brain. He comes out this way, out of your mouth. Breath and Spirit are the same word, same word. So when you speak the Word of God, that's spiritual words being spoken. When you pray in the Spirit, the Spirit who lives in you, He lives in you, He is expressing Himself. But if you're wanting to have the words come here, they won't. Because the Bible says that when we pray in the Spirit, our brain doesn't understand. Okay? I'm going to do what Mrs. Lindsay used to do when she prayed for students to receive. And she would give this picture. When Peter walked on the water, there were two things happening. One was natural, the other was a miracle. And when Peter walked, he walked like he always walked. And he picked up one foot in front of the other and walked. Nothing miraculous about the walking at all. He walked like he always walked. The fact that he was carried on the water, that was a miracle. God did that, and, and Peter can't do that. Peter can't stand up on the water and walk. He can't do that. 
God did that. But he walked like he always walked. And when you pray in the Spirit, two things are happening. One is natural. The other is a miracle. And the talking is you talking. The Holy Spirit's not out here. He's using your lips, your voice. You have to actually breathe in and make sound. But you can't say languages your brain knows. And see, I, I can't do that. I've been speaking in tongues since 1973, and I still don't understand what I'm saying. I'm not supposed to. Sometimes I understand by the Spirit, I know what I'm doing, but most of the time I don't have any idea. Can we all stand together, please? We all step forward just a little bit. If, if you know one of these folks well, if you know one of them well, would you come and stand behind them, please? Now, I'm not going to create a mood. I'm not going to, you know, slap you around and jerk your head and move you all around. I'm not going to do that. Because the Spirit of the Lord, He lives in you already. He's already there. I don't want you to touch them just yet, please. Folks that love you are standing behind you. But I want you to forget about everybody else. I just want you to put your attention on your spirit in the Lord, okay? I'm going to pray, and then I want you to get out of the boat and walk on the water. Just because you can begin to speak. Acts 2-4, it says, They began to speak as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. They began. They began. If you're waiting for some lightning bolt to hit you, that won't happen. They began to speak. Lord, thank you for your authority over us right now. Thank you for your particular and specific love for each one of these individuals. Thank you for your hand on them. Thank you for the freedom right now. The Spirit of the Lord lives in you. He lives in you. And every fear of men, every fear of this whole thing, we bind and reject in Jesus' name. And thank you for freedom right now. In the name of the Lord. Just everybody in the room, please begin to pray in the Spirit. And those of you down front, just go ahead and start. In Jesus' name, be filled and filled up with the Spirit of God. Just begin. Just begin. Just begin. No, 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 don't talk. Don't talk in English. Don't say words that your brain knows. Just start. Thank you for freedom to begin. Freedom to begin in Jesus' name. Just begin. Just begin. Just begin. God's the one that makes it a language. You can't do it. God makes it a language. You've got to give him something to work with. He's inside of you. Let him out. Just begin. Go ahead and keep praying in the spirit, please.
I stick it on the wall. I don't come in with food and drink. It's not allowed. I obey the rules because I want to see people after me enjoy this facility too. One minute. Come on up here quickly. Those of you who helped us paint from Thursday, Friday, Saturday, come on up here. I want everyone to see who you are. There's student council, RAs. These guys, come on up. Come join me. Come up here. Thank you, India. Everyone else, come on up. Come up. You guys are so humble. Come on up. <laughs> okay, now we started this project. Hang on a second. We started spread out nice and wide so we can see your faces. We started this project Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We covered all the hallways. Look at these doors. They're darker. You can see all the doors, all the hallways, the foyer, handrails. Everything and anything from Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we calculated about 800 man hours spent to renovate this project. Painting is fun only for the first 30 minutes and then it gets, becomes work, okay? And so they stick with us Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Some of them only went home midnight on Friday and Saturday. They didn't expect any money. How many of you know that's the kind of stuff Jesus would have done? He wasn't always just at the altar worshiping, even though he did that, but he's fruit show. And so I want to thank all of you students on behalf of the leadership, the Lindsay's Dr. Holler, for all your work and your investment. Thank you. Give it up for them as they make their way back to their seats. Thank you. You all ready to hear from Pastor Mike Massa? Hey, give a warm CF and I welcome to Mike Massa this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Sit down. Sit down. Let let me. Uh, I need you to acknowledge my wife, Nancy Nancy. Will you stand, please? Stand up. You are free to ask her any question except the one I told you not to ask.
may be as confrontational as, as some Christians sometimes make it, okay? If, you, if someone's kind of on the edge and you want to expose them to some of the spiritual realm and God and Jesus, this is a perfect opportunity because it's fun, there's lights, it's, it's not as intimidating as some other environment. So um, depends who they are. But grab some of these pamphlets and then hand them out, okay? Before we get Pastor Mike Mass up here, I want to do something special this morning. I think they like you. How many of you noticed when you walked in the foyers and the IB this morning that it looked a little different? It looks nice, doesn't it? This is home. I don't know about you, but I see this as my home. That's why when I come into the IB, I don't put my gum on my chair or I don't.